I'm talking to Andrea Swenson today, like I do every day, but uh, last weekend you had a crazy cool opportunity to sit down at Paisley Park with Jesse Johnson. Yes. And I knew that I wanted to talk to you. On Monday morning, I thought I'd heard a couple of things that were said. I kind of had the sense maybe they were taken out of context. I'm just going to the source. Tell me how it went. Yes. Okay, so this was a kickoff to Celebration. So it happened on Thursday of last week. Mm -hmm. And the way Celebration is set up is they want people to kind of move through the entire space of Paisley Park so not everyone is all together. So I ended up interviewing Jesse Johnson four times. So each time was about 45 minutes over the course of a day. I heard him speak for three and a half hours, mm -hmm. something like that. It was one of the most unique interview experiences I've ever had. Uh, the first session, I think I maybe asked three questions. Mm -hmm. The second session, two. The last session, I only <laughs> took one question. Mm -hmm. He was ready to speak, and he had something very specific that he wanted to share with this audience. And it was really powerful for me because he was so vulnerable, so open, so candid, and it really doesn't come across in a soundbite or two. Right. Because yes, he was addressing issues that he had. Mm -hmm. He and Prince did not have a good relationship for most of their lives. They had a really close relationship in the beginning and then they fractured apart. And I think something that Jesse really wanted to express was that he was heartbroken mm -hmm. by this. He loved Prince. Every time that we spoke, he got to a place where he was weeping mm -hmm. about his love for Prince. He said he loved him like a brother. He and Morris stayed. And I think he just was really looking to both forgive Prince and forgive himself. You know, we've talked about this before where, I mean, for the next 50 years, there could be another 50 panels on the anniversary of Prince's passing. And you're going to get the majority of, of people saying, he was a musical genius, he had a work ethic like no other, he could play any instrument, but this is the kind of story that I think is really compelling, and it's not because it's gossipy, it's because it's very vulnerable and very real. There are people that work with Prince, and some have come forward, some have not, but have, you know, maybe felt a little bit less than satisfied with maybe the credit they got or didn't get, and I think it's just really vulnerable and honest for him to have said, you know, and to have come to terms now with, he's gone, and right. we can't really repair that, but right. you did tell me <laughs> about the, uh, yes, 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 so there were a couple times when Jesse had the opportunity to try to repair this relationship, and he obviously regrets not taking these opportunities. One was when they came face-to-face uh, -face at the Grammys mm -hmm. in 2008. Uh, the time we're playing and Prince were playing, and they saw each other backstage, but Jesse kind of gave Prince the cold shoulder, and he's very regretful about that. Mm -hmm. The other time came just two weeks before Prince passed away. Uh, Jesse has a voicemail from Prince. Oh, man. He called him, and he had this very kind of heartfelt message to give him about how much he still respected him, how, how great of an artist he felt Jesse was, and then said some things about the people Jesse was working with now that I'm not sure if that's true or not, but right. um, basically what Jesse said is that he got this voicemail and it really hit him hard, and then he tried to call back and got like a doo-doo-doo, the number you've dialed right. cannot be connected right. because, as he put it, Prince must have just traveled with like 50 burner phones. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> made a call through it. <laughs> so there was no way to return the call, but he's very, um, just very regretful that he wasn't able to speak to Prince in that, in that moment. Um, he also shared a really sweet story of, you know, if you only look at what the press reported, you'd think he was just talking trash the whole yeah, time. Yeah, I know. He shared some really sweet stories mm -hmm. about his connection with Prince, and one of them was returning to Paisley Park, or actually visiting Paisley Park for the first time in uh, 1989, but returning into Prince's orbit for the first time really since Purple Rain. Wow. He was going to appear in the movie Graffiti Bridge, and he was really nervous about seeing Prince after, you know, five years. And Prince came running at him from across the room and came up and hugged him and said, it's about time someone who knows how to dress showed up. <laughs> <laughs> Coming from France. I know. Oh my God. Well, and I think too that anybody who was there and actually heard this discussion um, 
would have then probably also seemed like you described after he was done, how people kind of swarmed him with support. Hugging and, oh my gosh, yeah, getting his autograph, hugging him and saying they loved him and that it was just so powerful and like pretty much everyone in every session was crying at some point, you know, yeah. it was like, it was a really beautiful experience. Um, at the end of the day, he came up to me and kissed me on each cheek and said, you're my Barbara Walters. Oh! <laughs> So this is all just to go and show you, you know, don't believe everything you read because, you know, Andrea was there and I knew there was more to that story and I think it's it's pretty illuminating and pretty interesting and like I said, if you do this again for the next 20 years, hopefully you'll get some really personal stories like Jesse shared. Yeah, it's like you get the sense of the whole person mm -hmm. that, yeah, Prince isn't just this idea of like a magical unicorn. Mm -hmm. He's like a real person that had real issues like all of us. Absolutely.